Hi everybody, Rochelle Jones Lunch and Live at 11.45. Today is Friday, January, perhaps, might be January 15th. I don't know. Um, as you know, I meet in my car every Friday because I'm waiting to pick up a child from school, so I make this a time to be with you. Um, send me your thoughts, questions, whatever. Always know at the end of this, I post it eventually to YouTube, so um, the, the link is always available. Uh, also, there's a direct link on my website, griefrecoverywithrochelle.com. Okay, so, oh, it's the 17th. My husband, he's here helping me, saying the 17th. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All I know is that it's Friday, <laughs> and it's 11.45. Uh, so when my alarm goes off, I've got to go because I pick up my child. So, all right, thanks for joining, everybody. Thank you for being here. I have this on my mind. It came up yesterday, a couple of times yesterday, and, um, and then uh, I went to... Uh, a thing last night, a big seminar, and it came up again, and then it came up again today, and so I just thought, we've got to talk about this. It honestly comes up regularly, and it's this thought of, wait for it, therapy, 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 which I am not against therapy by any means, but I think um, it, it's it's being misunderstood and, off, and often misused because um, that's what society is teaching us, but here's how I want you to know if, if you're in the right place or not. Grief is the feelings that bubble up when you go through a moment that you wish, uh, that wish that would have been a little bit different. I, I wish that it, it, it could have been a little bit better. I wish I had a little bit more time. Different meaning, um, I wish I would have known differently. I wish I would have known what they were really like. I wish I would have known how that was going to end. I wish I would have known what I know now, basically. Better, um, I wish that our relationship was better. I wish that our communication was better. I wish that our living situation was better. Usually something in the past, right? And then more, one more try, one more thought, one more thing to say, one more whatever. Okay, so you have, every time you've got one of those things pop through your mind, you have a series of, of emotions build up that go with it, a series of feelings. Those That's called grief because we can't go back and make something different or better or more, right? So your soul knows that and hangs on to it as, yeah, but, but your mind's like, wait a minute, that's not real. You've got to stop it. We can't go back there. And your, and your soul, your spirit's like, yeah, but, and so it's always at war and it's that conflict between I know what I know, but yeah, but it keeps floating through my heart. It's frustrating. So that's what grief is. It's also hopes or dreams or expectations that didn't go quite the way we thought they would. They weren't met the way they thought they would be. And we don't even often know that we're creating hopes or dreams or expectations. I mean, sometimes we're aware, but you know, uh, for example, there, you know, we had the school shooting here in Saugus at Santa Clarita. And um, obviously, we don't expect that people are going to bring guns to school. We don't expect to send our kids to school and then have our whole um, bubble of safety and trust crash, right? We, we don't expect when we're driving that someone's going to cross over the line. We don't expect um, when we go to the store that the people are going to ram us with their cart. You know, just random things. We don't expect that that's going to happen. So when it does, it's a, what? or it's even bigger. And then um, our soul keeps going back to, I wish I would have known. I would have been on a different aisle. I wouldn't have gone to school that day. I would have gone to a different school. We would have moved. It, it, it's so noisy between what we know and what we're actually feeling. And so that is actually the definition of grief. It's just really that simple. And we use all these other words, trauma and PTSD and all these. Trauma and grief are the same. Um, we just use a different word. Hey, Jones, thanks everybody for joining. We just use these different words, but really they just point back to the very basic grief. So trauma is not different than grief. Grief is not different than trauma. Uh, grief is just the original dictionary definition. I know it's so fancy, right? Straight up from the dictionary. And then we say, so anyway, there's this prevailing thought, going back to therapy, there's this prevailing thought, which I even heard it. I heard it several times yesterday um, and even today. There's this prevailing thought that 
um, when something's going on in your life, you've got to get into a therapist. You've got to go to a therapist. I go to therapy. I need to get my kid into therapy. We all need to go to therapy. Everyone needs therapy. Everyone needs a therapist. Uh, you go through a shooting. I need a therapist. You go through a job loss. I need a therapist. Your health changes. I need a therapist. My kid's leaving for college. I need a therapist. Um, we're bankrupt. I need a therapist. Everything's about therapy, therapy. My marriage is hard. I need a therapist. I keep, you know, I have an eating disorder. I need a therapist. Okay. Is there grief in any of those one moments? Is there something that you wish would be different, better, or more? Try grief recovery method. Here's the thing. When we, our kids are, have just gone through the shooting. Our kids have gone through bullying. Our kids have gone through a loss of a friend, a loss of a pet. Our kids have gone through all of this stuff. Okay. And nobody taught us as parents what to do with their emotions. Their emotions make sense. They should have feelings about that. But we didn't learn what to do because nobody knew what to do with our emotions. So we say, oh, we've got to get them into therapy. There must be something wrong with them. I've got to get my kid into therapy is what we say. What's really happening is just nobody ever taught us. And here's the thing. Uh, I literally heard this quote last night. When your kids are having emotions pop up, you need to get them into a therapist. You need to get them into a trained expert. And then you just need to worry about being mom and dad. Correct me if I'm wrong, but mom and dad includes the happy moments, the sad moments, the crying over the bottle, the crying over the lost toy, the crying because their friend moved, the crying. It includes being present in their anger, in their sadness, in their worry over a test or an exam or their safety, right? Is that true? Or keep them busy. Yeah, people say that all the time, don't they, Cheryl? And we know staying busy is a complete piece of misinformation. It's, it's trash. It's garbage. All it's going to do is move us through time, but we're going to keep the collection of all that emotional business with us until we deal with it. The soul doesn't forget. The mind tries to and gets really busy trying, but the soul doesn't forget. And it will keep reminding you through, um, um, you know, like, Muscle aches, headaches, nausea, vomiting, ulcers, high blood pressure, heart disease, cancer. It's just manifesting. I'm, I'm trying to get your attention. I'm trying to get your attention. There's an emotional wound here that you never dealt with. Hold on, though. I'll get there in a minute. So there's this prevailing thought of you've got to get your kid into therapy. And what that really means is they have something going on and you didn't ever learn what to do with it. But if we have this prevailing idea of therapy, so your kid's got something going on, you've noticed it, and you want to get them into therapy. Good for you. Awesome. You've noticed something and you want to get them help. Excellent. But if you are waiting for a therapist, tell me right now, across the country, across the world, how many of you are trying to get into a therapist and you've got a six month, a two year wait, right? It says, hi, Jones. It's my least favorite saying at this moment, keeping busy is junk. Amen. Keep your in the yuck. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you guys are talking. I love that. So, we're trying to get our, I, I, every day get calls, emails, something. I'm trying to get into a therapist, but it's a six month wait or it's a two year wait or nobody's calling me back. They're buried. They're buried with people who are grieving, who need grief recovery services, not so much therapy services. So it's challenging because we're, we're going, there's nothing wrong with your head. If you have feelings bubble up because of a moment, you wish it would be different better or more. I mean, doesn't that describe a shooting? I wish I would have done, that would have gone differently. I wish I would have known differently. I would have never sent my kid there or, you know what I'm saying? I wish I would have done something differently or something could be different about that situation. It's grief. So as long as we believe that we need to send our kids somewhere else to get care, then, so, so who here would like to have a a connection with their kids or people around them, but their kids who would like to have an emotional connection with them. We kind of already do, right? Hi, thanks for joining. So if we want to have a connection with our kids. Why are we in their deepest moment, their present moment right now, their present moment says I'm hurting. Why do we say, hold on, I'll get you into therapy in six months or two years. How is that building trust and safety with your child? When you're not helping them. I was with someone yesterday who um, their child is seven and said, mommy, am I fat? And the person said, no, no, no. Why would you think that? And I was just like, oh, the poor mom, you know, to hear your child say that it hurts. And then the baby and then what happened? So they said, but you know what? I got it figured out. I went on the internet 
I found, um, you know, what I'm supposed to do. And what I'm supposed to do is just, you know, remind her of how kind she is and remind her of how beautiful her eyes are and things like that. And I listened. And then I looked at her and I said, so here's the thing. Let's imagine right now that I'm going to kick you. I kick you in the shin. And I kick you hard. Okay. Now you've got that wound on your shin. But I say, did I ever tell you how kind you are? Do you know how pretty your eyes are? I saw you treat that person so well. You really studied hard for that test. Is that going to take away from the wound that I just created on your shin? But that's what we're doing. Society is teaching us we need to only focus on the positive, only focus on the joy. So what's going to happen is we focus on these things over here and we're sending the message to the children that, guess what, that wound that's on your heart, however you decided or started looking at yourself, doubting that you're per less than perfect, uh, are you fat or whatever, whatever inserted into their soul at that moment is a wound. It's an emotional wound. And so now we're telling them, Listen, I don't really want to talk about it. I don't want to pay attention to it. Let's just focus on how beautiful you are. Let's focus on what a good person you are. So they're just going to keep the wound hidden because your behavior is telling them you don't want to see it. You don't know what to do with it. So you ignore it and focus on other things. Does that erase the fact that a wound happened? No, but what it does is teach them they can't come to you with their actual feelings because you're not going to give them the time of day. You're not going to pay attention to it. And so then it starts to grow and fester into, I literally, um, my son was anorexic in sixth grade. I didn't, I couldn't get to the bottom of it. I wasn't catching the signs enough. And so, um, in six, I was actually in some ways, but I, it was a whole story. Anyway, we had to do a lot of grief recovery work. Let me tell you that. But if you think about, uh, if I'm letting my child continue carrying this wound, it's going to grow and fester. So in sixth grade, they're wanting to fit in and be approved of, but they're afraid that they're fat. So they start eating differently or exercising differently. Those aren't bad, but they still have that wound. And that wound's going to grow into when they're 16, they just don't feel right. They don't feel like they're, they're fitting in. So now they're going to start cutting. Oh, and then they just don't feel right. So then they're looking at ways to kill themselves. And then, do you see what I'm saying? There's a ripple effect, which gets bigger and bigger and bigger over time because the wound wasn't treated. So if you are waiting for six months, two years for therapy, you're letting this wound grow and fester into who knows what kind of arena. And really it could have been nipped in the bud had you had some skills in the moment. So what I do is I support the caretaker. I teach, equip, and empower the caretaker. I show you what to say or not say, do or not do in the moment to treat that wound. And it doesn't involve looking over there at this other positive thing. That's not, that's not treating a wound. That's avoiding the wound. Could you imagine as a nurse and you come into my hospital because you've broken your arm, but I start playing with your hair and showing you how to brush your teeth? It's just weird, right? Those are helpful, but we've got a wound called a broken arm to deal with here. So when, you're, when your children have, um, you know, effects from the shooting and you say, hold on, don't talk to me about it. I got to get you a therapist. You're missing the connection in that moment. You're missing a very, very huge, powerful opportunity to help your child. And, and why? Because society is telling you, you're not qualified. All they're doing is enabling you to stay uneducated, ignorant. We don't want to be ignorant parents, right? We're already trying our best, but I'm here to make your best better. I'm here to educate and equip the caretaker, the teachers, the law enforcement. So apparently there was a situation today at the same school where there's a shooting and emergencies called and whatever they think there's another shooting. Let me tell you, I, my heart is like in my gut, imagining the moment of, oh my God, there's another shooter at the school. I mean, I think in some ways, if you go through an intense situation, you're like, oh no, that's not going to happen again. So for it to kind of feel as though it's happening again and the, the teacher's panicking and get out of the, get in the room. Come on, come on. Imagine that. What's going on in the teacher's heart and mind? 
we've got to heal their wounds. We've got law enforcement getting a call again that there's a shooting at the school again. We've got to help the caretakers. Because what happens is your body is like, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. And it keeps trying to alert you and alert you. It's happening to your kids. But the thing is, you ignore the alerts because you're waiting for two years to get into therapy when that's not quite what you needed in the first place. The wound keeps bleeding and screaming and getting louder and affecting more of your moments. So it's your, your soul is sitting, alert, alert. <gasps> that's scary. There's my alarm. Your soul is saying, that was scary. That was loud noise. That was loud noise. And so as law enforcement, you get so many calls like that. You eventually become numb to the alerts of your soul, which is helpful, sure, in those situations. But guess what it is? And when you get a pausing moment, you get triggers, you get blasts of memory, you get blasts of fear. You're back in the moment. And what do we call that today? PTSD. But now thinking about what I just said, PTSD is just a louder message of, hey, you didn't deal with all of these wounds in here. It's never too late to start grief recovery, but it's also never too early. You've got to learn how to heal the wound. This is, this is first aid treatment for emotional wounds that happen when they happen. You can choose when you want to receive your first aid treatment, but you're still going to need the first aid treatment. They don't disappear, guys. Emotional wounds don't go away. And so we slap a, we slap a, a note on it called PTSD or a label, and then we start treating it like it's this massive break in the system, which really, it happened way over here, and you just need to learn how to heal because the wound is still there. Waiting six months and two years is dangerous for therapy. Therapy is wonderful when it's used correctly. For a grieving situation, it's not used correctly. My nine-year-old wanted me to enroll her in the gym because someone called her fat at school. Oh boy, my dear friend, I'm so sad about that. What's that like for you as a parent, your heart to hear that message and to see that pain it caused in your child? Hear me say this though, it's not going away. It will grow into bigger and louder and more painful messages. As that child grows, they will try to overcome it by going to the gym, eating right, exercising, or just give in to it because, well, what's the use? It's not going to work anyway. We've got to heal that wound. There was a wound inflicted on that poor little baby's um, intuition, and you are capable of healing it. I just need to show you how. Please don't let that grow. It is not going to serve you or your child well. Ooh, cutting constant reminders. Yeah. Definitely. Um, banana. Thank you for re responding to each other. This is heartbreaking. Hurt people hurt people, but that's no excuse to be mean. Amen. And it's no excuse to let them stay wounded. I promise you they stay wounded and it just takes on different effects as they're trying to figure out what to do after that. Let's just say, um, you know, if I use the gym to feel better from my emotional wounds, I can. There's nothing wrong with going to the gym. But if I'm using it to feel better from my emotional wounds, what happens when I'm sick and I can't go to the gym. Oh my gosh, all the wounds come roaring back, don't they? You're using the wrong fix for the job. Not a bad one, but not helpful for that wound. Does that make sense? Um, hammered that on the head. Yeah. My heart breaks for you and your daughter. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for caring for one another. Hey, friend. Thanks for joining. Um, so do we understand that really, really, really clearly? My class is to help you, the adult, know what to do in the moment. Because when your child is crying out in pain, emotionally, whatever you're seeing, but you say, mm, I just want to be mom and dad. Let me get you a therapist. What's the point of being mom and dad if you're going to ignore the wounds as they're happening? What's the point? I mean, we can do better, you guys. We can and we need to. And I'm calling you to do better with me because passing them off to someone else when you're capable. You just need to take a minute to get trained. By the way, speaking of which, two-day class coming January 25th and 26th, two days to educate and equip yourself to help your kids for the rest of their life. Why is this class not full? Two days, you guys, and January is 30% off. I gotta, I gotta pay the bills for the office, so um, two days. And if you don't want the two-day version, I have a four-week version and I have an eight-week version. Why are we not filling these classes? 
And why are we waiting for six months or two years for someone to do the job you should be doing at home, in your classroom, in your school, in your community? It's up to you. Quit passing the buck onto the therapist. And I got to promise you something right now. Just because they have more letters on the end of their name does still not mean they're the right person for the job. It's you. And until you take a moment to educate and equip yourself, I'm telling you, your child's not going to be that much helped anyway. It'll be five years, 10 years, 20 years from now of therapy before you realize, well, shoot, that didn't work. But then they're an adult and they don't have to listen to you and they don't have to get help. It's dangerous. Quit playing around. Get on the phone, get on the email, get in my class or another person's class. There are only about 10 people in the world who offer these two-day classes. I don't understand why they're not full. I don't. It's mind-boggling, baffling to me. Two long days of learning to better your home, better your love, better your connection, better the quality of your relationship to yourself, better the quality of your relationship to others, better the quality of your relationship to pain, painful, emotional stuff. It's up to you. But passing the buck isn't going to do the job. I promise you that. You've got a lifetime ahead of you. Passing the buck's not going to work. So I hope that's helpful for you. I hope you've learned something today. I hope that you have shifted in your prevailing thought of it's someone else's job. I'm telling you right now, it is yours. Whichever human is in your presence, it is your job to give them something of value. Okay? So, I love you all. Thank you for joining. Thank you for listening. And I'm really, really looking forward to hearing your feedback and what class you're going to be in from any gosh darn specialist on this in this earth. All right, love you all. Thanks for joining Lunch Live 1145. I will see you next Friday. Send in your thoughts, questions. Thank you for talking with one another, taking a minute to see one another. Um, life changing. Please take it for you. Mm-hmm. Yep. Thank you for sharing your heart. Um, it's Mahal Arnis. Thank you for sharing about your baby. I hate that that happened. I hate, hate, hate that that happened to you to her. Um, I would, I wish nobody would ever be wounded in their heart. And, um, I, it, it hurts knowing that they are. So I feel sad for you, for her. Um, and I trust that you're going to do good work to help her heal that wound. So, all right. I love you all. Talk to you next time. Bye everybody.